Let's pray. Our great God, how we need these words to cause our hearts to soar with thoughts of the ages to come when we will be in your presence, when the hardships of this life will be a distant fading memory, when we will no longer even have the ability to sin, to think errant thoughts, to dishonor you in any way, but will only be full of joy and delight in your presence. God, we need these moments together as those who claim your name and follow your son to recalibrate our hearts to eternal things, to the right things. I pray in these next moments as we sit under your word that you would do your work, that you by your Holy Spirit would employ your word to accomplish the things in us that you desire. And we ask it for your glory, for our good, in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite you to turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. And this morning we'll be looking at the last chapter of Ecclesiastes. This week and next we'll be in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. The end is near. You've seen the signs the sandwich board signs on the guy on the corner of the street. The end is near. He holds that sign a little bit differently than the other signs you see. You know, the home furnishing closeout sale. That guy's got headphones on and he's dancing and he's throwing that sign all over the place and he's smiling and waving to passersby. But the guy with that end is near sign looks like he hasn't eaten or bathed in a week. He's morose. He's warning us all that dire circumstances are just around the corner. And you know he's right. Jesus said no one knows the hour or the day when he himself will bring history to its end. But if we personalize that sign and we say, your end is near, that man is righter than he thinks. The message from Ecclesiastes 12 this morning is worship God while you still have time. Worship God while you still have time. We will encounter here a command and then a plea for us to understand the urgency of that command. Let's look at the command. It begins in Ecclesiastes 12.1 and Solomon says this. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. Solomon's command is simple and straightforward. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. And you who are young in this room are in the crosshairs of this passage. The rest of us are not off the hook, and I don't know where you choose to categorize yourself. Some of us will be the illustration for this passage, and some of us will be the targets of this passage. When Solomon tells us to remember our Creator in the days of our youth, he is not asking us to reminisce about the fact that we have been created. He's not not asking us to simply give mental cognizance to the fact that God exists. I want to introduce us this morning to a bit of a theology of remembering and forgetting. In Deuteronomy, which is something like the constitutional document of the Old Testament, it's the covenant that God made with his people Israel, the two-way covenant of blessings for obedience and cursing and separation and exile for disobedience. And embedded inside of that two-way covenant is God's one-way covenant with Israel, where he says, even though I know you will fault, on the two-way covenant, I will bring you back. And one day I will give you new hearts to believe. And in the book of Deuteronomy, this constitutional document for the nation, which serves in part as the backdrop to Solomon's writing in Ecclesiastes, he encourages the people of Israel over and over again to remember. 
and to not forget. And if you want to keep your finger in Ecclesiastes, but open to the book of Deuteronomy, I just want to trace a few of the the ways that the writer of Deuteronomy, Moses, encourages the people of Israel to remember and to not forget. And this is going to help us understand what Solomon means when he says, remember your creator. We'll start in Deuteronomy 4, verse 9. Deuteronomy 4, verse 9. Only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and to your grandsons. Deuteronomy 4.10, Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb when the Lord said to me, Assemble the people that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and they may teach their children. Don't forget how you've been rescued. Remember your God so that you will fear him all the days that you live on the earth. Deuteronomy 4.23. Watch yourselves that you do not forget the covenant of the Lord your God which he made with you and make yourselves a graven image in the form of anything against which the Lord your God has commanded you. There to remember God means to not make idols. Deuteronomy 4.31, for the Lord your God is a compassionate God. He will not fail you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant with your fathers which he swore to you. There God is the one who says he will not forget. And for God to not forget his people or for God to remember his people means he is faithful to act in their benefit. To act favorably on their behalf. Deuteronomy 7.18, you shall not be afraid of them. You shall well remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. There to remember their rescue was actually to place their faith and their trust in God and to be rid of anxiety. Deuteronomy 8.11 Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments and His ordinances and His statutes which I'm commanding you today. There forgetting the Lord was equated to disobeying the Lord. Deuteronomy 8, 19. It shall come about if you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you today that you shall surely perish. To forget the Lord was to worship other gods. Deuteronomy 15, 15. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you. There a command follows remembering. Deuteronomy 16, 3. You shall not eat leavened bread. Seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, so that you may remember all the days of your life the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. And Israel had an entire holiday, the Passover, set aside for remembering their rescue. Isaiah 65, 11, hearkens back to Deuteronomy. And this is common throughout all of the prophets. And and you can sort of develop this theology of remembering throughout the prophets as they look back to the covenant documents and realize that Israel failed on their end of the bargain. Isaiah says, But you who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who set a table for fortune, and who fill cups with mixed wine for destiny. Right? They're playing the astrology charts instead of trusting Yahweh. Why? Because they forgot. Hosea 13, 6, as they had their pasture, they became satisfied, and being satisfied, their heart became proud, therefore they forgot me. Isaiah 51, 13, you have forgotten the Lord, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, that you fear continually all day long because of the fury of the oppressor. Jeremiah 3, 21, A voice is heard on the bare heights, the weeping and the supplication of the sons of Israel because they have perverted their way and they have forgotten the Lord your God. Jeremiah 18, 19. My people have forgotten me. They burn incense to worthless gods and they have stumbled from their ways from the ancient paths. Jeremiah 50, verse 5. They will ask for the way to Zion, turning their faces in its direction and they will come that they may join themselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant that will not be forgotten. You see, there's a day coming for Israel when they will no longer forget the Lord. They will remember Him 
They will obey. They will worship Him. The whole idea of remembering and forgetting is often appealed to God in prayer. Moses prayed in Deuteronomy 9, 27, Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not look at the stubbornness of this people or at their wickedness or their sin. And Moses appeals to God, please remember us. In other words, act favorably toward us. Psalm 25, 6, Remember, O Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness, for they have been from of old. And the psalmist writes in Psalm 105, verse 8, God has remembered his covenant forever the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. And God himself promises in Ezekiel 16, Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. As you think through Israel's founding, and then the prophets addressing Israel in their rebellion, the words remembering and forgetting occur again and again, hearkening back to the people's relationship with God and their responsibilities in the covenant. For God to remember His people meant that God would act for their welfare. God would act on their behalf. It doesn't mean that God just happens to sort of remember that they exist, but to remember them meant to act in loving kindness for them. And for God's people to remember Him means to think about Him, but to think about Him in a way that shapes actions and motivates obedience that removes all rivals for His glory, to honor, to obey, to be faithful to Him. In short, to remember God in this way is to worship Him with one's whole life. Notice what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 12, remember also your Creator. Your Creator. He doesn't say the Creator. He personalizes this. This is not an abstract concept that we just simply have a creator, but a personal responsibility. You, as an individual, were built by God for His glory, and you will give account for the degree to which you lived up to your purpose. And it's important that Solomon says, remember your creator. He uses this title for God. The word creator is the Hebrew word bara. Uh, It's a verb that is never used of people. It is only ever used of Yahweh. It is right to say, only God creates. That is, only He draws out of nothing everything. You and I can be said to be creative, but we don't mean it in this way. We sort of rearrange what God has brought out ex nihilo. This is a uniqueness for God. And interestingly, the word for creator here is in plural form. Uh, Kind of like the title for God, Elohim. That em ending in Hebrew is like our S in English. It's a plural. And the same thing is true of the word creator here. Uh, Some say that this is a literary way to speak of the bigness or the majesty of our creator. Uh, It could be that this is an Old Testament allowance for, for a plurality of persons in the Godhead. And all of this harkens back to the creation narrative. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. And Ecclesiastes has been so heavily dependent on the book of Genesis, especially chapters 1, 2, and 3. And for us to remember our creator is to remember the purpose of man, the purpose of man's relationship to God and his purpose in the universe. It reminds us of man's original innocence, and it reminds us of the fall. And it ought to remind us of God's plan for redemption. The fact that we are to remember our creator in the days of your youth. It speaks of the God of the Bible as the one universal God. Right? He's not merely the tribal deity of Israel. The Israelites have their God. uh, The Canaanites have their God. The Egyptians have their God. No, he is the one true God. He is the maker of all things. For God to be creator means that everything is from Him and through Him and to Him. It means that we are not to live independently or self-sufficiently. To remember your creator is to remember that you owe Him everything. It means that God is the giver of life, the sustainer of life, and the taker of life. Ecclesiastes is an echo of the creation and the fall of man. Solomon brings this up in chapter 3 and chapter 7 and chapter 11 and again here in chapter 12. And Solomon says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. 
He means by this when, when life is good. When you have days full of energy and vitality and ability and opportunity and time out in front of you. And the contrast happens in the second part of the verse. Remember your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come. There are other days in life that are not as vibrant or energetic or opportune as the days of your youth. And this leads us into the larger portion of our text this morning. And here Solomon is pressing the urgency of this command. The urgency of this command. And, and it comes by way of an extended illustration. You see, time is running out. Your body is wearing down. And you are not, no matter what Rod Stewart may claim, forever young. What follows in these verses is a rather bleak picture. The downhill accelerating slide toward death. This portion of scripture is dark and at some points shockingly violent. We shouldn't let the beautiful poetry of this section of scripture remove us from the macabre reality that is at stake. It is at times shockingly violent. And I think we need to let it sear its impressions onto our minds. One of the best exercises in life is to regularly contemplate one's own death. And this passage is going to help us do just that. To walk us through the aging process. The decline of our physical capabilities. And walk us straight into the dirt. The final Inevitable, irreversible demise of our bodies. The first seven verses of this chapter are all one sentence. And reading it feels like you are running, going and going, panting, and finally out of breath. Now let's read this all together. Beginning in verse 1. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and clouds return after the rain. In the day that the watchmen of the house tremble and mighty men stoop, the grinding ones stand idle because they are few, and those who look through windows grow dim, and the doors on the street are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low, and one will arise at the sound of the bird, and all the daughters of song will sing softly. Furthermore, men are afraid of high place and of terrors on the road. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags himself along, and the caperberry is ineffective. For man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about in the street. Remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed. The pitcher by the well is shattered and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. Days and years, Solomon speaks of. In the second half of verse 1, where trials make time slow down and even drag out, days flew by, you look back on your youth and, and they just seem to be a blur and, and in the midst of the aging process, things slow down. These are times of affliction. This extended depiction of the end of life is a season of hardships as we age and come face to face with the physical demise leading to death. And notice what Solomon says about those bad days coming. You will say, I have no delight in them. One writer said it this way, age with its liabilities has extracted from our days all pleasure they might have afforded. Notice verse 2. Before the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are darkened. The sun grows dim 
That faithful orb that has arced across our horizon daily without fail goes dark. And then he says the light is darkened. Not just the sources of light, the sun, moon, and stars, but light itself is darkened. Now you remember the creation account that light existed by God's decree independent of sun, moon, and stars. And then he says the moon and the stars go dark as well. I believe darkness here is a picture of the absence of joy. All those sources of of brightness and light and, and delight have been dimmed. And darkness in Scripture is also a sign of judgment. You can read Joel chapter 2 and Joel 3 and Amos 8 and a number of other places in the prophets. Those are apocalyptic sections of our Bible. Speaking about end times judgment where God blinks out the lights that have been so faithfully shining in our skies. I believe Solomon here is painting an apocalyptic picture. This is what happens to the individual emotionally in the age of process. And it resembles what will happen at the end of the world. You will experience your own personal apocalypse. He goes on in verse 2 to say, And clouds return after the rain. Normally the rain falls, clouds dissipate, sun breaks through. But in this depiction, after the rain is done, the clouds gather strength again, and it just keeps on raining. It's like a rainy day in Seattle, on repeat in the movie Groundhog Day. The hits just keep on coming. The sun just won't return. There is no break in the clouds, no rainbows. It's depressing. And you know, in your youth, you were resilient You could handle a string of rainy days together. You'd go jump in a puddle. And when you're old, it's depressing. There is a decreasing ability to enjoy life, and life just gets increasingly more difficult. This picture of the evil days continues in verses 3 to 7. And the meaning of Solomon's intent here does not depend on the exact identification of all the parts of this extended metaphor. But together this morning, we're going to take a shot at deciphering the pieces of Solomon's imagery here. And there are several pictures woven together, but they're all painting the same image, a person's physical decline in the process of aging. In verses 3 and 4, the the image is one of a great house, a once prosperous, productive estate, now in a state of disrepair and declining activity. And this great house is intended to depict the decline of the human body. Look at verse 3. In the day that the watchmen of the house tremble and mighty men stoop, the grinding ones stand idle because they are few, and those who look through windows grow dim. What are these picture? The watchmen of the house those protectors of the human body, the, the arms and hands, uh, the, those strong implements that are designed to ward off danger and catch you in a fall, are not so strong. And they tremble with age. He says the mighty men stoop. Those strongest muscle groups in the body, the legs and the back, hunched over bow-legged, weak. What do you think these grinding ones are who stand idle because they are few? Teeth. Teeth. In the picture of the great house, the, the, the grain mill would be grinding the grain. As this is depicting the human body, you have those teeth which are grinding the morsels of, few, uh, of food. But as the teeth fall out and there are a few of them there, the, the, the grinding slows down. He says, those who look through windows grow dim. What is that? Yeah, your sight, the eyes. Whether through cataracts or degenerative blindness, the sight begins to fail. In verse 4, we read, The doors on the street are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low, and one will arise at the sound of the bird, and all the daughters of song will sing softly. Those doors on the street are probably the ears, 
that which allows in the, the sound of all the activity that is going on, the, the hearing begins to fade. And then he says, one will arise at the sound of a bird. And here's the paradox of old age. You can't hear very well, but the slightest noise disturbs the sleep. Not sleeping all the way through the night. And then he says, all the daughters of song will sing softly. Sounds grow faint and indistinct. What used to be loud and crisp has become a series of low mumbles. This great house, the human body, has grown decrepit, dark, and forlorn. It is slowing down. It is growing quiet. Solomon paints the picture of the aging process further in verse 5 with images from the world of nature. He says, first of all, men are afraid of high places and of terrors on the road. Men, men are afraid of heights. Why? Because weakness and instability and fragility have taken the manliness out of the man. Why would I want to climb that ladder? I might fall and I might not get up. The same man in his youth was more accustomed to climbing everything in sight just because it was there. There aren't many two-story homes in Sun City. Falling is more likely. And the consequences are more costly when you are older. Fear and caution have replaced the bravado of youth. Men are afraid of terrors on the road, Solomon says. You owned the road in your youth. And now you don't want to leave the house. Solomon goes on to say that the almond tree blossoms. Flowers on an almond tree are initially pink, but they eventually turn silvery white and fall to the ground like snowflakes. What do you think this is a picture of? Graying, silvering hair that eventually falls. Then he says, the grasshopper drags himself along. Literally, the grasshopper drags itself along as a heavy load. The grasshopper itself has become a heavy load that the grasshopper can't seem to move very well. This is a pathetic picture of an athletic creature way past its prime. Did you know a two-inch grasshopper has a 20-inch vertical? A 40-inch horizontal leap. By comparison, Michael Jordan at 78 inches had a 48-inch vertical. If Michael Jordan could have jumped like a grasshopper, he would have had a 780-inch vertical. That's 65 feet, enough to jump over a five-story building. The grasshopper, so light, so agile, so powerful, and now it struggles to drag its own weight down the sidewalk. Solomon next says, the caperberry is ineffective. A lot of Bible translations just translate caperberry as desire, and that's appropriate. Uh, The caperberry was seen as an aphrodisiac stimulating sexual desire. That desire has failed. And then he says, for man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about in the street. His eternal home. Where is all of this headed To eternity, to a home, a place of permanent residence. And what happens in the demise of the human constitution is a permanent change. There is no going back. It is inevitable and irreversible. There is no second chance at this life. Every physical malady is a reminder to us that we are headed inexorably toward the end of this life. Meanwhile... Those behind us on the path say goodbye, they cry a bit, and they go on with their life. The mourners here in verse 5 who go about in the street are the paid professionals. They're not the family members and close friends who would be in the house together. These are the people who, according to common custom in the ancient world, would be hired to give public displays of sorrow. It's rent-a-weep, right? 
Lamenters.com. These are criers on call. They're mercenary mourners. They're paid powders. And when the gig is up and they get their check, they go on with life. Get a sandwich, go home to their families, carry on, wait for the next gig. It's all so sad. The picture that Solomon is painting takes a dramatic turn in verses 6 and 7. The picture here is violent, brutal, abrupt. Remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed. The pitcher by the well is shattered and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. This silver cord and golden bowl is probably a picture of a lamp, a golden basin of oil used for light hung by a silver chain, and the chain breaks and the lamp falls and the golden bowl full of lamp oil is destroyed. The light goes out and the vessel, so beautifully constructed of precious metals, is demolished. Some have said this is a metaphor for the spinal cord and the cranium. Next, Solomon says, the pitcher by the well is shattered and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. You can imagine the machinery at a well, a pitcher that is lowered by a rope over a pulley down into the well to retrieve life-giving water. The vessel designed to carry water is smashed, and the wheel literally is smashed into the cistern. The whole apparatus gives way, plunges into the well, and is demolished. That machinery which keeps life going breaks down, collapses upon itself bringing a sudden end to life. And some thinking about the analogy have have thought maybe this is a reference to internal organs, uh, the machinery that pumps life-giving supplies to the body. In verse 7, Solomon says, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was. This reflects back to man's makeup and man's end because of the fall, because of sin. Genesis 2.7 says, The Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. After the fall, Genesis 3.19, God says to the man, By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you are dust And to dust you shall return. It's a sad picture. But it was always going to be this way. From the day that you were born to this very moment, you have been on a pathway of incurable demise. And it will culminate in the demolition of your body and the dissolution of your spirit. As Solomon says, the spirit will return To God who gave it. And despite all of the warning signs that come with the aging process, this final scene always seems to surprise us. It always seems to happen so suddenly, and all opportunities come to an abrupt end. What does Solomon mean when he says the spirit returns to God who gave it? The body goes to the dirt. The spirit, the immaterial you, goes to God. This is disintegration. Up to this point, you've always been integral. You've had integrity between the outer you and the inner you. The material being and the immaterial being. And at death, that is separated, disintegrated. That which has always been together in the human constitution has been rent apart. And the Spirit returns to God. God gave you your life, and God will demand an accounting for your life. Prepare to meet your Maker. Amos gives a similar warning. Amos chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. Therefore thus I will do to you, Israel, because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. 
For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts, he who makes dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. We all get back to him. Look at Solomon's response in verse 8, the summary of his emotions. <laughs> Vanity of vanities, Hevel Hevelim. Hevel, the frustrated, fleeting sense that he has given to everything in this book. And vanity upon vanities. Of all the proclamations of vanity in this book, for Solomon, this one is the capstone. Or we might say the headstone. The most vexing, the hardest to take, the most difficult to swallow. It's where he started in chapter 1 verse 2. It's where he finishes here. One writer has said, death is clearly the major problem, which intensifies and exacerbates all others. The specter of death mocks the brave plans of the living. Men cannot argue with this specter. They cannot combat it. It will win in the end. In the remainder of our time here this morning, I want us to just think about this command. Worship God while you still have time. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Whatever moments and days you have left on this earth, what does this mean for us? It means you must choose to live for God now. Now. To give God the best of what you have. Think about it. If you spend and waste your entire young life You give God the dregs? You give God the leftovers? Well, the idea here is that we give God the best of our time and talents and resources and physical abilities. While there is still time to make a difference in how you live, <laughs> worship Him. Old age robs us of the freedoms and the abilities to do the things that life affords. Opportunities to glorify God in, in work, in family, in fun and recreation. All of these things are to be under the banner of worship. And if you're not rightly related to Him, you waste them all. This passage serves to guard us against the mindless waste of our best years. C.T. Studd, the missionary, wrote a poem, and I'll read a couple of stanzas. Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life, twill soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life, twill soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. This reminds me of the beauty of gospel filled homes. Where the gospel is proclaimed when youths are youths. When the Bible is read in living rooms by parents who understand this command and its urgency. And we praise God for ministries like Next Generation. Of faithful teachers week after week teaching our kids these very things. I'm reminded of the danger of waiting to repent. You might think, well, I'll repent tomorrow. I've lived every moment so far. Surely I'll have another moment. Surely I can put off getting my life right with God. And my friends, there are no guarantees. You cannot predict the way you will exit this world, but exit it you will. And if you set your heart on a course that desires to wait, to repent, there is no guarantee that you will ever stop waiting. 
and you will meet your maker. Only with the things you've made of yourself, which he will not accept. There is, of course, the danger of judicial hardening. There's another theme in Scripture you can trace out as you read your Bible. How does God respond to hardness of heart? He may give you more. How does God respond to the sinner who stiff arms God and says, Give me my space? God may give you exactly what you're asking for. In Matthew chapter 13, sort of the turning point in Jesus' earthly ministry, he had been explaining his parables to the crowds. And when the religious leadership of Israel blamed Jesus' miracles on Satan, Jesus said, that's it. I'm going to withdraw my explanations and I'm only going to explain my parables to the disciples. I'll teach them clearly, but to the crowds, I'm going to speak in a way that hearing they will not hear. That was a judgment from God. Give me stone silence, said the deaf man. Give me more darkness, said the blind man. Give me more folly, cried the fool. And God may give you what you want. I think about those who have remembered their creator. In the days of their youth or later. I had a friend that participated in our wedding who came to Christ in his 90s. And he died at 103. And he was joyful in Christ. There is a way to age with grace. And I don't mean a style of aging. I don't mean age with graciousness or age with elegance. I mean age with God's saving grace. God's saving grace in the life of one of His own overturns the darkness and the depression of the aging process we just read about. (laughs) And of course, it changes what death is. See, when Jesus came to the earth, he told us he came to lay his life down. He told us he came to experience death itself. And not just as an example, not just as a portrayal of some poor guy who uh, felt empathy for people who were going to die. No, Jesus came to taste death for us. To actually die in our place. To die as a substitute. To take the payment for our sin. Jesus knew what it was to die. But his death for all who would believe in him guarantees resurrection. Bodily resurrection. Where the spirit who departs and is with God is one day reunited with a physical body reintegrated, to be what man was always supposed to be. And Jesus has purchased the conquering of death and the beauty and benefits and glories of resurrection for all who would believe in him. You see, while every spirit departs and goes back to God, many go for judgment. Only those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work at the cross escape God's wrath, escape God's judgment, enjoy the resurrection, and get to live for the reason they were made. Listen to Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His godly ones. You see, death changes for those who have remembered their creator. And Paul echoes this sentiment in 2 Corinthians 4.16, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. And in 2 Corinthians 5.1, we know that if the earthly tent which is our house is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Let's pray. Oh God, we 
pray with the psalmist in Psalm 71. You have taught me from my youth, and I still declare your wondrous deeds. And even when I am old and gray, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation and your power to all who are to come. O God, may we be those who remember you. We must use our youth, for we are losing it. We desire to give you our best days and not the leftovers. We pray even this week, God, that you would strengthen us to live for your glory while we still can. Take our lives, take our time, our abilities, our relationships, our opportunities, our talents, and may you use them for things that echo into eternity, for your glory and for our good. We pray it in Jesus' name.